Mr. President, says we can start. Yes, uh, good afternoon, welcome back. Uh, for me, this is one of the highlights, the next two sessions. A little bit off the beam, uh, not uh, TV related specifically, but certainly uh, both of these guys are uh, top of their tree as far as I'm concerned in, in the areas. And certainly the preamps is uh, something that's very relevant to what we do. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sam, who's going to come and talk about uh, VHF and UHF preamps. And I would point out, because I'm sure he's going to be too modest to do so, that uh, he's got to stand out there. He's going to be selling the kits of, uh, that he's talking about. So, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's see what we can do, Sam. We, we're going to give them the full time. So uh, Sam's got 35 minutes and Brian's going to have 45 minutes and we'll catch up uh, later on. So uh, over to you, Sam. Thank you. Noel asked me if I would do a talk about uh, my various uh, preamplifiers and preamplifier design, but aimed at the sort of thing that uh, is required for amateur TV, as opposed to maybe moon bouncing or terrestrial DXing. So I've tried to change the format uh, of uh, the original talk such that it now uh, hopefully is, is more orientated. Oh, fall off. Excuse me for a moment. Okay, if I drop that again, let me know. <laughs> uh, so I've changed the talk, I hope, such that it's more meaningful for uh, TV people than maybe the EME people, which the original talk was aimed at. Uh, this is the basic content of the talk. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the devices that were available in the past that we may have used. Um, I suspect that that will get one or two of you going a little bit. You'll be well into the reminiscence thing. Um, a little bit about uh, the requirements for low noise circuits, uh, meeting those requirements, uh, practical low noise preamplifiers, and then a look at where we may be going from there, and I've got something to show you, which uh, you will see in practical wireless. Uh, practical wireless. You will see in Radcom in my column uh, later this month. Okay, the reminiscing should have started now. Most of you will, I suspect, are of such an age that you will recognise that particular circuit or something like it. This came from. Uh, Jessup's um, RSGB UHF manual. Published by me. By you. Well, there you go. So Ian G3KKD published it. Now that is uh, certainly one of my earliest recollections of a uh, masthead uh, low noise preamplifier. It uses a germanium transistor, an AF139. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the circuit that's involved in there sometime uh, later on. And there's a picture of the device. Generally, it was mounted uh, such that the screened can, there's four leads coming out of it, one of these is a screen connection, but very often this was connected to uh, a, an internal screen in the preamplifier. But there are a lot of other notable semiconductor low noise devices around uh, that followed on from things like the AF139. I'm sure a lot of you will remember the GMO290 used extensively in a lot of the Pi equipment. Uh, GMO 290 front ends were very, very popular around that sort of era. Uh, AF239 and AF279, which were later developments of the AF139. Uh, as time went on, we moved on to silicon bipolars, and here the BF180 was a very popular device, particularly at two metres. You could get down to ah, two and a half dB noise figure, or better with one of those. The previous circuit, if you got below 3 dB, you were probably doing well. Uh, BFR90 is still used, and uh, something which was quite revolutionary when it came out was the NEC NE645. Uh, this was a little Micro X packaged plastic pa package device. And with that, you could get down to about 1 dB on 70 centimetres. Kind of following on from there, uh, silicon MOSFETs like the BF981, which is a dual-gate MOSFET, of course, and very popular on 2 metres, maybe less so on 70 centimetres, but it was the mainstay 
of uh, two meter low noise preamplifiers for a long time. Moving on from there, uh, gallium arsenide devices and dual gate uh, gallium arsenide mesfets, because uh, these were mesfets, um, devices which were published in lots of places at the time CF300, S3030s, 3SK97s. Uh, and I had a circuit that used, I can't remember which one of these devices it was now, published in Practical Wireless in 1984. Uh, single gate MESFETs, uh, things like the Drexel DX35, this was one of the real workhorses for real low noise, 70 centimetres, 23 centimetres. Um, I still have a pristine one of these in a box, not that I ever intend to use it, but it's... Uh, um, I, I lusted after one of those many years ago, and when I actually got one, oh yes, I'm going to keep this. Uh, MGF 1400s and um, th uh, 1200s, of course, quite popular. MGF 1302 in MESFETs, again, built into lots of preamplifiers. The SSB Electronics pre Masthead preamplifiers tended to use the 1302. Uh, MESFETs were generally are being replaced by, because they haven't completely disappeared yet, single gate hence high electron mobility transistors. There's still gallium arsenide and some of the notable devices in there, things like the NE325, which is used in lots of designs, FHX06, and the thing which I use a lot of, MGF4919. I'm sure you could add a lot more to that list, your favourite devices. But now we're tending to move into this era, uh, high electron mobility transistors hemped mimics and um, the SPS 5043 is probably the best known of uh, these devices. Uh, my own little broadband amplifiers use those but lots of other people are using them. Lots of designs published on the continent. And then just come out recently the SPF 1089 um, which is actually a PGA 103 plus and we will see a bit more about those later on. Incidentally, if you've got any questions, please ask, uh, particularly if it's for a point of clarification. If it's just a general question and it can wait to the end, that's probably better. But if you do need something clarifying, please just ask. Now, what's been happening is with the development, we've seen the intrinsic device noise figure has fallen. Now, that's important. Note I'm talking about the intrinsic noise figure of the device itself. Uh, the operating frequency has risen. You can now get low noise devices operating well into the millimetre wave bands. And the other big improvement has come about mainly through the use of hemp technology is the dynamic range has improved dramatically. A lot of you will probably have an aversion to using masthead preamplifiers because when I add a masthead preamplifier to my system it overloads the preamplifier and I have all sorts of problems. These days the dynamic range of the masthead preamplifier or the, the active devices is such that that should no longer be your problem. Look downstream for the problems now, not in the masthead preamps. Okay, what does low noise preamplifier mean for us? Well, generally it means anything which has got a noise figure below 3 dB, but most radio amateurs will laugh at something with a 3 dB noise figure. For us, 1 dB tends to be the magic figure, unless, of course, you're going for uh, EMI operation. But for terrestrial, 1 dB is a, is a pretty good number to aim for. And today, that's so easy to achieve that if you're running a system which has got a 1 dB noise figure, goodness, you're really not trying. <laughs> Dynamic range is not always important. I'll say a little bit more about that later. And just for the record, currently the low noise uh, amplifier frontier for radio amateurs lies in the 76 gigahertz band. Tom Williams, WA1 MBS in the States, uh, MBA, sorry, has been doing a lot of work uh, on mimic preamplifiers for the 76 gigahertz band to get the guys going on EMI. And that for radio amateurs is where the low noise frontier is at the moment. Can't remember what noise figure he's achieving, but it's... It's pretty good compared with a, a raw mixer. Okay, so let's have a look at the requirements for a low noise preamplifier. Now, uh, if you have 
your antenna, we generally, for radio amateur purposes, consider that this has an impedance, a nominal impedance of 50 ohms. So that's what that's going to present to the coaxial cable and down into your receiver. Over here, we have a preamplifier device. For the moment, it doesn't matter what that device is. Now that device, in order to deliver the lowest noise figure, doesn't want to see, very rarely, wants to see 50 ohms. It wants to see something called gamma optimum, gamma opt. Now that's an impedance which is not 50 ohms. So we've immediately got a problem here. Presenting 50 ohms from an antenna, and we've got a device that's saying, now nah, 50 ohms is not good enough, I need to see this value, gamma opt. So what we need to do is to get these two together. We need to introduce something which will provide a noise match. Now, just, I just want to emphasize this again. This device is looking out towards the antenna, and it's saying that the impedance I see when I'm looking out towards the antenna is gamma opt. At that, I will give you the lowest noise figure. The antenna, on the other hand, is looking in and saying, here I am, 50 ohms. Ne'er the twain shall meet. Well, ne'er the twain shall meet unless you do this. So we introduce a matching network. Sorry about the uh, gaudy colours. This is usually a low-loss matching network, and it's introduced so that when this device looks out towards 50 ohms, it sees gamma opt. When this looks in, it doesn't necessarily see 50 ohms. But this is the low-loss matching network that we need to introduce. Noise match. Sorry, Ian, if I'd known you were going to be here today, I'd have left this slide out. <laughs> noise match? What noise match? <laughs> this amplifier doesn't have a noise match. However, it's operated in common base, and the impedance looking into there is somewhere in the region, probably 50, uh, sorry, 20 to about 70 ohms. So it's in the right order, and these devices did deliver something pretty close to their optimum noise performance when looking at that. So there is no noise matching circuit in there. It just relies on the inherent impedance. This thing wants to look at something like a nominal 50 ohms and by heaven that's what you present it with. You've all seen the sort of uh, SSB electronics masthead preamplifier circuits and, and, and circuits that have been published in various magazines over the years. And they consist of an active device and an antenna. And this is your matching circuit. Now, that matching circuit um, is quite critical. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. It has to be low loss because the total noise figure that you see is the loss of that network plus the intrinsic noise figure of the device itself. Now, this may well get down to something of the order of 0.1 dB noise figure, but if this matching network has got 3 dB of loss, the total noise figure is 3.1 dB. You want to get this loss down to uh, the, the absolute minimum that you can achieve, and particularly with time as the intrinsic noise figure has gone down here, so the requirements on the loss of this network have increased. It really has to be low, noise, uh, low loss. Uh, this is one of the simplest matching networks for VHF. It consists of uh, a parallel resonant circuit, uh, L1, and uh, a capacitor. And in this case, there is a capacitor that taps the antenna into the top of the resonant circuit, but it could equally be a, an ohmic tap onto the coil. Generally, this is done because it allows you more flexibility in setting the match uh, than you would get with just a tapped coil. Uh, any of you who have built these sort of preamplifiers in the past of BF981s and that will have probably tapped up and down this coil trying to find the lowest noise figure, and that will do. <laughs> now, that previous one was for VHF. Here are the sort of typical circuits that we use uh, this is a coaxial cavity uh, or trough line cavity. This is, um, you would have your uh, FET 
connected here, probably more likely connected up here. And this would be your antenna connection. But again, you could have a series capacitor here. Uh, this gives a nice high Q, and your reason for that you'll see in a moment. Uh, suitable for 70 centimetres. Over here we've got microstrip. This is microstrip plus wire. Uh, this is microstrip stub, little matching section there, decoupling down here. And this is probably just a wire loop. DJ9B V preamplifier is probably the best known of these. And this is suitable for um, probably 23 centimetres and up. Mini kits one as well? Yeah, well, the mini kits one, I believe, is pretty much a DJ9BV, if you look at it. Okay, why is this matching network so critical? Right, now, the, the loss of that matching network is the ratio of the unloaded Q of the resonator to the loaded Q. Now, you want to keep this ratio as large as you can get it. Bigger the better. So the lowest loss is when the unloaded Q is high and the loaded Q is low. However, there are limits to what you can do. Uh, if you have a, a coil and capacitor type resonator, if you can get a Q of 500, you're actually doing quite well. Uh, with the best designs, probably 750 is about as far as you can go without going to extraordinary lengths. So there's a limit to the maximum, the unloaded Q, that you can get in a practical circuit. Now there's also a limit to what you can get for the loaded Q. And the limit here is because there is a transformation ratio of the antenna impedance to the impedance seen for this best noise figure. Um, that sets the lowest QL that you can get. Currently that limit for certain devices is in the region of 3 to 5. Um, with some of the preamplifier designs that have been around for a few years now, this has tended to be of the order of maybe 50, and this might be 200. So you can imagine the loss of those matching circuits has been high. That's why when you built that BF981 preamplifier, you couldn't get the noise figure below a couple of dB. This is why. If you, again, this part will just concentrate on VHF for the moment. So we'll talk about the input resonator. This is about the best you can do. This is a helical resonator. Uh, the the uh, inductor or the filtering element that's built in there, you, you want the, um, the pitch of the coil or inductor, resonator, uh, the wire, uh, wire diameter, uh, the diameter of the inductor, um, its spacing from the surrounding grounds and its length and that. These are all critical to getting the highest Q. If you get this right, you can get at two metres, you can get up to about 750. You're not going to get much better than that. And we're going to make things worse anyway because you couldn't use it just as it is there in a preamplifier. Um, tuning it for a start, you would have to squeeze the coil or introduce a piece of metal into the top here as a top capacity hat. And then you've got to connect this to the active device and then you've got to either have another capacitor from here to the antenna input uh, or tap onto the coil. So 750 is probably optimistic in a real circuit. There is an alternative matching circuit which is suitable for UHF. Uh, uh, sorry, this it's not your eyes. It's just I've blown this up so much that the resolution has gone. But here we've got uh, a, a simple circuit. It looks like a T circuit, but in fact it's actually uh, more like a Pi circuit. You've got a, an input capacitor, uh, which is not necessarily that critical to this matching circuit. Um, L1, the series inductor, certainly is. You've got another uh, inductor here, which is uh, carrying bias into the device, but it's also part of the network. There's also, not shown here, there's the intrinsic gate to source capacitance of the device itself. Uh, there's not much you can do about that. That's inherent in the device that you have. But that's a very simple wideband and a very low loss matching network. It's nowhere near as critical as the VHF one I was showing you just now. So this is very suitable for 23 centimetres, 13 centimetres, 9 centimetres. So guess why I've got it built into my VLNA. And also with care, down to 70 centimetres.
right. Now, uh, something to be very aware of. Um, this, this raises a lot of interesting questions. If you have got those sort of matching networks that I have shown you, then looking into the device, you will see that the match is dreadful. Um, if you know what I know, mean by return loss, you'll find that if you get 1 to 2 dB return loss, you're doing quite well. Now, that doesn't matter from the low noise point of view. It makes no difference at all. Um, but it is a poor match looking in. So why would we even bother to worry about it? Now, a poor input match, uh, it doesn't matter for noise figure because it's a signal noise and voltage, not a power transfer that we're concerned with. We're not trying to power transfer from the antenna to the device. We're interested in the signal and noise voltage that's presented at the input. But if you've got a preamplifier, uh, which has a very poor input return loss, there are two things which immediately can cause problems. First is the frequency response. If you put a filter in front of that preamplifier, the filter probably wants to be looking at 50 ohms. And what's it going to be looking at? It could be anything. The return loss is so poor. So you'll get ripple in the passband of your filter. Unless, of course, you put in a 3 dB attenuator between the filter and the low noise preamplifier. <laughs> and we're now on a very deadly spiral downwards. <laughs> now, the other thing that it does, and this has been incredibly topical in the EMI world recently, is uh, the poorer the input return loss... Um, you start getting problems with the uncertainties in measuring the noise figure. And there is an online calculator from Hewlett-Packard which enables you to take the um, uh, input return loss and so on, the output return loss, S11, S22, and you can calculate the uncertainty in the measurements. And you find that these days we're claiming a 0.2 dB noise figure preamplifier plus or minus 0.25, uh, pardon me, this, uh, if you can get that return loss up, <coughs> 7, 8, 9, 10 or better dB, then some of the uncertainty starts to go away and you start to get towards the real noise figure. Um, but we can do something about it. We can use something called lossless negative feedback to improve this situation. Now, this is something which was invented by a guy who worked at um, Texas Instruments, uh, and now I believe, until recently at least, with Triquint. And this is lossless negative feedback. Now what we do here is we put some source inductance into the active device. Uh, and I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Now that adds negative feedback. This tends to improve the input return loss, providing you get this right. Uh, and because there's no resistive component in this, you don't get any degradation in the noise figure, or negligible uh, degradation in noise figure. Uh, you also get a reduction in gain, and with some devices, that's also something which is very worthwhile having, especially when you're trying to di balance dynamic range in a preamplifier. Uh, um, this is a picture taken inside one of my VLNAs. Here's the gas vet, here's that input matching circuit, Here's the gas vet stood up on little wires. Oh, my God, you say. You can't do that. I have spent years and years and years making sure this thing's flat on the board. There is no inductance in there. You can't do that. It's impossible. Go away. You can't do this. Um, and most professionals have tended to, to, to keep away from that technique as well. But uh, RW3BP, Sergi, uh, did some work... Uh, he actually had uh, um, a couple of my preamplifiers. He did quite a lot of work to improve noise figure. And one of the things that he did was to stand the gas fed up on wires, actually, which were probably even longer than these, if I remember correctly. And he just looked ridiculous. It was absolutely fine. With all the other improvements in that, he was getting noise figures, verified noise figures, of the order of 0.14 dB at 23 centimetres. Not using... HP test gear, but using proper fundamental techniques. But, okay, we'll all go away and we'll all stand our active devices up on little wires and the sun will shine forevermore. Uh -uh. If you put source inductance in there, you will get instability. 
And the usual thing that happens is, is that extra inductance can result in an oscillation, generally somewhere in the region of 6 to 20 gigahertz. If you've got a good scope that will see up there, and yes, I do, and yes, it does, and yes, I've been there. Um, but the one thing that a lot of the guys have done is, oh, I just, I just can't take this. I can't have this oscillation. That's it. I can't use this technique. But you can cure it by the use of absorber material. This is uh, the particular ma material I use. Uh, these three strips are, are, are where I've arrived at after a lot of experimentation. This is a ab surface absorber material. It's silicon. It's slightly magnetic. You put a magnet near it, it will you know, pop up. Um, this particular one has a surface absorption maximum about about 6 gigahertz. And wouldn't you just know it, when you put the gas vets on legs about that long, guess where this thing takes off about? Yep, about 6 gigahertz. You put this in there, and it says, oh, lovely, feed me. And the 6 gigs is gone. It just stabilizes it. Um, this is the most critical one. Uh, the end wall one is one I added early on, and it tends to help the overall stability. So that brings me nicely on to the VLNA, which is the preamplifiers that I've been making and selling as kits for the last five years or so. It's a two-stage low-noise preamplifier which uses that technique that I was just talking about. Uh, it was originally designed uh, for 1296 MHz. It's basically the WD5AGO design, but uh, I changed the second stage device because the device he was using was getting extremely hard to get hold of. Sergi then did that work on the long gate, uh, the long source leads and some other things, and it's gradually uh, changed to become this very low noise amplifier that I now uh, sell. Um, it was originally 1296. Um, it was not difficult to extend that to 2.3 gigahertz, um, and then onwards to 3.4 gigahertz, and then... Uh, now down to 430, 440. I mean, those are not the frequencies it will operate at. These are spot amateur bands in there. It can be made to operate anywhere in that frequency range, down to 408 here and up to 3.56, I think, at the top end. That's the highest I've seen one of these go so far. Here's some um, typical noise figures. Actually, they're not typical. They are... Um, no, uh, noise figures which I have taken the high end. I, when I build these things for people, I don't sell made preamplifiers, but if somebody buys a kit off me and asks me to build it for them, if I've got the time, I will do that. But I record religiously all the numbers that I get. So these are numbers that are taken from my test equipment uh, and verified on other test equipment and at the EMI conference this year and so on. So on 70 centimetres... Uh, better than 0.35 dB. There are lots of preamps around with lower noise figure than that, uh, but not with 40 dB gain. So you have a, a 0.25 dB 70 cent preamplifier with um, 12 dB of gain, but then you need a second stage, and you put that in there, and it's not a good low noise one, and the next thing you know is the thing's hooting. Here we've got 40 dB of gain, and it isn't hooting. How are we doing? Right, 23 centimetres, um, point, better than 0.3, down to 0.2, 37 dB of gain, 0.3 now better than 0.3 on 13 centimetres, 28 dB of gain, this is the second stage rolling off, 9 centimetres better than 0.45 and 27 dB of gain. Okay, uh, where are we going next? And, and the next in my five minutes left is uh, the low noise mimics like the SPF 5043 from uh, RFMD uh, and many circuit labs. This is a typical data sheet. They're 0.8 dB at 900 megs, a gain of 18 point to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, these things are designed to be used as drivers and masthead preamplifiers in mobile systems. Incidentally, I'll pass it around. That's one of the VLNAs. So you want to have a look? I'd like, yeah, I'd like one back, please, if it's possible. <laughs> but the, um, the SPF device, uh, let's move on. This is, this is this actual one, and you may have seen this in Scatterpoint, if you take Scatterpoint. This is quite a remarkable little device, um, kind of one of the first of a new generation of hemp mimics, low noise, typically 0.6 foot. Well, I'll put some numbers up in a moment, but that's the little amplifier. Uh, 
um, and a very, very simple circuit to use it. Um, sorry if you can't read this too well, but these are numbers for that particular one. Uh, so we see we've got usable gain still down here at 30 megahertz and a 2 dB noise figure. Quite a good terminator for mixers at 28 megs and a transverter. Uh, 2 meters, 22.5 dB of gain, 0.68 dB noise figure for that one. Uh, gained down slightly at 70 centimeters, but still 0.68. 1296, we've got 15.5 dB of gain and 0.86 dB noise figure and so on up. There's still a little bit of gain left there at 9 centimetres and the noise figure is still pretty respectable for that band 2.3 dB. You can always put a VLNA in front of it if you want a lower noise figure. Uh, so that's a nice little easy to use device. Um, Kent produced boards for those which is what I have been using um, and the, the whole preamplifier kit is, is, is 12 quid so it's the sort of thing that it's nice and small and you can just drop it into inside a piece of equipment where you need a bit more gain or you need to get the noise figure down so very easy to use okay this is something you'll see in radcom uh, this coming month um, in, in use it as a pa yes it'll do it'll do the best part of uh, 200 milliwatts out Okay, thanks for that, Noel. Uh, this is what's in. Whoops, let's come back to that. This is what will be in Radcom uh, this month. This is a PGA 103 plus um, from Mini Circuits. It's a ne next generation on from those SPF 5043s. Now this thing uh, is also 50 megs to 4G, but we'll go down to 30 megs as you'll see in a moment. We'll go up to 4G quite happily. These are the numbers measured for this particular one, and I'll pass this round as well. So you can say, oh, look, I, I held that one that was in Radcom this month. <laughs> uh, here we see the, these amazing numbers. Look, at 30 megs, half a dB noise figure, 26.2 dB of gain. We go to two metres, look, under half a dB from a mimic. 25.2 uh, dB of gain. It's got an input return loss of 8.7 dB at that frequency. That's quite remarkable. And, again, as you'll read in the article, uh, you can improve on that further. Output return loss of 22 dB and a saturated output at that frequency of 22.5 dB. So not at two metres, not quite as powerful as the 5043. But as we go up, I'll, I'll show you we, things get better. So that's 144 megahertz, 432. Well, we're just around the half dB mark, 21.5 dB of gain. 10.6, for, for RF engineers, professional RF engineers, 10 dB and better return losses is, is a good match. Uh, 1296, 0.8 dB, 14.1 dB of gain, 14.7 dB output return loss, um, sorry, input return loss, output return loss 15.4, and P-saturated output now, 24.5 dB. On 23 centimetres, this thing has got an output intercept of plus 43 dBm. I mean, it's got an input intercept with that gain of almost one watt. Put that at masthead with all these mobile things around you, put a decent bandpass filter after it, then worry about your set-top box or whatever that follows it up, because you ain't going to disturb this thing particularly easily. Uh, I only took this one up to... Oh, I'm at the end. Up to 1,600 megs. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'll just pass this round. This is uh, an Arlon version um, board for that PGA 103 Plus. Um, I've got the first of these boards in. I'm waiting for some devices. About the end of the year, these will be available. These will probably be about the same price, £12. But have a look, see. These are quite remarkable. Where to next? I don't know. So, Sam, you, you've touched on uh, one thing that was really interesting. Um, the whole idea of using them in systems... Preamp filtering receivers. I mean, and that that is the the way you would recommend. The, the, the preamps these days are good enough to put natively at the masthead without filtering on the front end. Even the, the wideband things. The problem people have is getting good low loss input filters. I, I touched on the subject for VHF there, but for 23 centimeters in particular, with a mobile mast on 600 megs and a 
and there'll soon be some on 700 megs and we've got 1800 meg systems 2.1 g systems you uh, plus the digital tv transmitters um, there are a lot of high power continuous carrier signals around you now on these bands uh, but the mobile operators themselves have the same problems with their own masthead preamplifiers and these devices have been developed so that they can uh, build filtered um, uh, masthead preamplifiers the intermodulation uh, problem has gone right down because of the in input, inter uh, input intercept of these devices you can take a leaf out of the same book try it, you may well find that even if you've got a mobile mast half a mile away from you, you don't have the problem that you had before but you will need filtering after it because all of those signals are amplified and are now hitting whatever receiver system you've got afterwards. So make sure you've got good filtering after the preamplifier so you can get good low noise figure on the input and excellent output to intercept on the preamplifiers. Those things are the equivalent of a 4.7 ohm resistor. What a 4.7 ohm resistor, sorry, a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor is to the home constructor, these are to the systems engineer. It's the universal preamp as against the universal resistor. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's really useful to understand that, that you can start to put these devices up front without any filtering at the masthead, filter down in the shack. You'll have to suck it and see for any particular location, but we are moving rapidly in that direction. Yeah, and I mean, I, I've used, as you know, several of those SPF devices. There's one on the local UHF repeater here. There's one on GB3IV, the uh, video repeater down in on the Isle of Wight. And, you know, they seem pretty bomb-proof. Okay. Any other, any other questions quickly? Oh, yes, I thought there might be. Uh, fine when you're looking at uh, cold sky, but what about... Um, fine when you're looking at a cold sky, but what about um, antenna noise when we're looking at terrestrial signals like amateur television? Invariably, you're going to have cables and things between the antenna and the preamplifier. The total system noise figure is at, uh, sky temperature, plus the loss is ahead of the preamplifier and then if we take the preamplifier itself as part of the, the receiver system if you can keep that contribution low you can get away with maybe not quite so good uh, in front of the preamplifier so it's always worth getting those noise figures down I, don't, I can't think of any circumstances where you wouldn't want to do that uh, for, for, for ATV use if we take the typical design of the 2 meter preamp which you showed it originally came the SSB electronics with a tapped coil, and I then moved it to the capacitor in se variable capacitor in series. Much better performance, but the problem is, as soon as I come on 70 SEMS digital, that's the end of usefulness of the preamp. <laughs> because, the, because, of course, there's no um, uh, high-pass roll-off with that input circuit. Uh, it's a, good, a very good point. Um, the recommendation uh, from LEAF um, SM5 BSZ is that you do uh, use a tapped input rather than the, uh, having uh, the series capacitor. There's another disadvantage to the series capacitor, and that is that you will get lower um, resonator Q simply because it's the capacitance to ground plus that and you want to minimise those capacitance and, in, and increase the inductance. Uh, if you don't do that, the resonator Q will go down, the losses will go up, you'll get all sorts of problems. Okay, probably time for one more. Justin? So, so one, one thing that confused me slightly in the earlier slides, uh, the, the, the amplifiers showed at a 40 dB gain, but um, uh, I was also brought to, uh, up to understand that the um, real objective of the masthead amplifier was to uh, overcome the feeder loss. Um, so is, is that a bit too much gain in the system? Uh, it depends on the, on the preamplifier, of course. The, you really need to run a program like uh, HP's AppCAD and run an analysis and see exactly where you get uh, the optimum dynamic range. And, and for any particular system, you really need to run those sort of numbers. The great thing is if you've got a bit too much gain, as long as you've got the dynamic range in the preamplifier, you can always put attenuators after the preamplifier. It helps to stabilise the system as well. Um, so the short answer is yes, um, don't use too much gain. But if you've got too much gain, it's easier to get rid of it. It's not easy to get it. <laughs> okay, no? Good. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, um,